Well, good morning. We are just a few minutes from getting started, but we have started online. If you um, are watching um, by video later on, um, we uh, feel free to both turn in prayer requests, ask questions. You can always do that after the fact. Um, and we're going to give a couple of minutes um, as people are joining with us um, online. And uh, do we want to have the mic today? It's, it's up here? Oh. Test. Testing one. So Heather, how are you? Good. Good. Yay, Good to see you. So, <laughs> just so if you're online and you missed the question, the question was, did I get to do my disc golf tournament? And um, now I did go and play disc golf yesterday for the first time since the snow. And, um, and so uh, a prayer concern for me is my shoulder. Um, I might have shared a little bit, but... Um, you know, it, it could be tendonitis or it could be something more structural. And, um, and so I haven't used my right arm for a month. And, um, which means when I've gone to play, I'm playing left-handed. And um, my, I've told my friends who I golf with that they cannot take any pictures or photograph or video of me doing this left-handed. But... <laughs> Um, I played with my right hand for the first time yesterday, and um, it hurt. And um, so that's a sad thing. So my next step is making an appointment, making an appointment with a doctor and having it looked at. Um, now, if I threw 50%, then I wouldn't have any pain. And... Um, Ben only beat me by a couple strokes with me throwing 50%. So that, that, that was, and, and he got lucky because I had a couple, you know, but, but, but that aside, um, yeah, it, it was nice to be out and get my steps in and it was sunny yesterday and yeah. it was, you can't go with it covered in snow. So that, that's, you know, I mean, you could lose your disc really easily. Back straight. Yep. Yep. So prayers for my shoulder will be much appreciated. Okay, so uh, good morning, and we are in Colossians today. A reminder that um, uh, Sean is with us, and you have, if you have questions, she will be monitoring on Facebook Live, and so you can both turn in prayer requests and ask questions. We will pray uh, for one another at the end, um, but let's open with prayer as we um, jump into Colossians again. Lord, we give thanks for this day. Um, thank you for sunshine. Thank you for um, where we are right now, that um, vaccinations are happening, um, that we are in this place where um, in the past, something that has typically taken like five years to be able to do a vaccine, um, you know, there. There has been uh, great efforts put forward so that we can try to get back to some level of normal, normalcy. Um, but Lord, beyond all that's happened among uh, 
what we have done as humans. We look to you today. Pray your blessings. Um, pray that uh, you will help guide our leaders and decision makers and policy makers that um, they would really be making decisions in the best interest for people. And while there's much debate over some of these things, Lord, we do pray um, for the successes of um, moving towards herd immunity. Uh, pray for, continue to pray for doctors and nurses and people who are serving at the front lines in the midst of this pandemic. Thank you for their efforts, give them strength. For us today, Lord, pray blessings that we would hear your word, respond to you, and uh, grow up in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. So we were in, we're in Colossians, and we were in chapter 1, and um, we were focusing in on um, Paul's explanation of who Jesus is. Um, and as I shared uh, on Monday, one of the um, more significant Christological, which is um, knowledge information of, of Christ, Christology is the study of Christ, the word of Christ, and, um, and this is one of the New Testament passages that give us um, very strong affirmation of who is Jesus. Fully God, fully human, um, the creator, the savior. Um, and then we, after grounding that, then Paul's reminding, and this is what Jesus has done for you. An apostle of the Gentiles speaking to this uh, predominantly, um, and, and we don't know as much about Colossae because they're not in Acts, but we would assume predominantly um, Greco-Roman congregation, probably not very many Jews. Um, he's talking about, um, you know, and especially with this statement, you were alienated from God, enemies um, in your minds because of evil behavior, um, you know, and a lot of that's pointing to the idea of outside the covenant. And um, this is the gospel that we proclaim that you have uh, believed in. So he makes those statements. Um, this is who Jesus is. This is what he's done for you. And now Paul turns to his situation. This is a little bit reminiscent of Philippians. Um, it's a little bit different. This isn't a letter of friendship like the letter of Philippians was. Um, and we will find out, you know, that Paul is in prison. Um, it, but it, at this moment, um, I'm just making sure um, what we and and they know he's in prison. They've sent a Paphros. Paphros is coming back. Um, but, but we're going to get into this section where Paul's going to talk about his own present sufferings. And, um, and, and at the outset, one of the things is, is that, um, you know, we're, we're, all of us, especially if you were receiving the letter, you're going to sit there and you're going to say, what exactly is he talking about? I mean, that's what you do. You read a letter and you're trying to understand you know, where they're coming from, and oftentimes it's easy because there's relationship, and there's less relationship between Paul and the Colossians, right? He's not their founder. Um, he was the one who was a disciple maker for, for Epaphras and Epaphras plan of the church in Colossae. But there is connection. Uh, Epaphras um, was underneath Paul, and so, and Paul's aware. We've already heard this. He's been praying for them. Um, he rejoices over them. But we're going to come into this section, and he's going to talk about his own suffering. And then he's going to talk about how his suffering is filling up what was lacking in Christ's suffering. And, um, yeah, you know, and so this is one of these areas where, hmm, what exactly does Paul mean? So I'm going to read it for you. I realize that um, all any of us can do is try to interpret this. Um, and, and, and we're going to come up with guesses. And there are some different guesses that you could do. But even while we may not 
get every particular down solid where we can sit there and go, oh, this is exactly what Paul meant by it. Um, you know, we can get the big picture. And um, so let me read this section. Now, now I, Paul, rejoice in what was suffered for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions. Now, you hear this and go, huh. So let's go back, because when you're, you know, is when you're reading and you're not quite sure, how do we, what, what's going on? It's always good you go back. We heard the part about Jesus, his supremacy. And so in verse 21, once you were alienated from God, so we heard about Jesus and now he's telling us about the condition of the Colossians. Once you were alienated from God, were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death. Oh, death, suffering, Jesus in our place. Okay, now I'm kind of catching up. We're talking about salvation and how Jesus' death for us ended up being the means by which we're saved. Um, the purpose of his death was to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Again, a, a picture of liberation setting free, free from the curse of sin, free from the fall, being able to present you holy and blameless so that you can live into a new type of life, which is the new creation, the Holy Spirit living in you, your saints, right? Holy people, um, not defined by, by your past and by your sins, but defined by your future, which isn't fully realized yet because the resurrection hasn't happened. But you can be assured that nobody will fall out of Jesus' hands, so you're going to get there. Now, I gave you a little more information that's in there, but that's the background theology that Paul teaches, and that's what this is based on. Um, that he may present you to live a life worthy of the Lord, and may please him in every way. Oh wait, I skipped over, that's totally, sorry. But verse 23, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel you heard that has been proclaimed. So you're gonna be a disciple. You're gonna follow Jesus. You're gonna live according to the gospel. How did you get into this? Because Jesus died for you. There's the suffering in my place, him dying. Not just dying, by the way, being crucified, which is a terrible form of torture, but not just being crucified, but receiving the penalty of our sin in our place. Okay. Now, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I rejoice in what Jesus did for you. What's it, he's going to clarify that in him too? Okay. Yeah. The first time you said it sounded more like maybe what Jesus had suffered. Well, it points. It's pointing back to that. That in um. So, what what's your translation? The uh, the T N T N I V. Okay, and this one is the N I V. And so this is the older translation. And in the TNIV, they're wanting to clarify because the immediate context here is the immediate context. So, so this is, I'm, I'm sure this is the more literal translation what you have here, which is now I rejoice in what was suffered for you. And it's a little ambiguous. Is he talking about Jesus suffering? Is he ta what's he talking about? And then the, the immediate co-text of what's going on in this sentence, Paul then starts talking about himself. And so with that ambiguity, the translators come back and then they refine the translation to say, in this sentence, Paul is really talking about his own sufferings. So that's why your translation is different than this one. Now, it's probably the case that Paul has a little bit where he's pointing backwards to Jesus, but then he's, he, he's pointing forwards to himself, and that gets clarified. And this is how it comes out in the older version. Now I rejoice in what was suffered, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking. And, and the way this is done is, is that there's a little bit pointing back, but 
I'm rejoicing also in what was still lacking in the suffering that I have done. And, and the way that this is said is it is said in the singular, what was lacking in Christ's suffering, which I fill up in my flesh. And so this is, I'll, let me read it through it again and then I'll come back and I'll comment. So you hear the whole part. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. I become a servant by the commission of God gave me to present you to the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Um, so he makes this statement about rejoicing in the suffering. Now, He's not rejoicing in the fact that he's suffering or in the fact that Jesus had to suffer. He's rejoicing in the purpose for which the suffering was done, right? So again, as Christians, we're, we're not, we're not woo-hooing, I get to go suffer. We're woo-hooing that through the suffering, good things happen in this instance. And in fact, in Christ, good things will happen. And even if I suffer, God can take those things and use them for some purpose. And Paul's expressing that idea here, where I'm rejoicing that in my sufferings, in some way I'm filling up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions for the body. Wow! Right? I mean that, and, and people, hmm. now, on one level we take this, it's God's word, it's inspired. Now what does it mean? In what way was Christ's suffering insufficient? Um, now, here's the big divergent part. Is this exemplary where what Paul's saying in the singular can basically be true for everybody who ends up being a follower of Jesus and some way suffers for his name? Do you get that? So Paul's talking about what's going on in his own life we find out he's in prison. And, and at this level, it means at least this. And I'll, I'll give you a beautiful picture. Um, this is one that N.T. Wright gives in his, in his lay, lay person's commentary, the New Testament for everyone. He says, so picture a tree growing up and spreading out its branches. And, um, and, and it ends up being the bulwark and protection against the, the storm for the smaller trees behind it. In some way, that's a picture of what Paul is talking about here. He is rejoicing over the fact that he's suffering for them. And, and probably in some way taking the heat off because he's in a Roman prison right now. And because he's in a Roman prison, it, it may altogether be possible that people are sitting there and thinking, okay, this is taken care of, and so we don't have to worry about these other people because we got the leader under, under guard. And so, it, it, in some way, probably something like that's going on where Paul is rejoicing over the fact that he's basically getting the brunt of of the attack at this point. Now the question becomes, is this singularly, singularly apostolic, where Paul himself is filling up what is lacking in Christ, and this isn't something that is exemplary, where Christians who end up suffering in Jesus' name are in some way filling up what was lacking in the afflictions of Christ. And to be perfectly honest, nobody can answer this question, absolutely, this is the right interpretation. But we can approach this question through biblical theology and say, while, we, while we're not altogether sure what Paul meant exactly by this, um, there are some things that I think we can reflect on biblically, theologically, historically. Um, so in Revelation, if you remember our study, we looked at the faithful witness of the church 
represented by two symbolic figures that were two witnesses, one that looked like Moses and one that looked like Elijah. And in Revelation, those, those symbols were really representative of the church in its role as witness. Two authoritative witnesses in word and in power going out, proclaiming. The world hated it, attacked them, killed them, left them dead in the streets. They suffered. And then after three and a half days, they rose from the dead. And people saw this and feared God and praised him, which all through the rest of Revelation becomes a sign of repentance. And it actually ends up answering a question that God asked um, in the little interlude, I think it was in the seven... Um, Oh, let's see, you got seven seals, seven um, trumpets. It's the interlude of the seven trumpets. And um, ha, ha, what's going to bring about repentance? And the answer is, is that the faithful church and witness that suffers like Jesus brings about repentance because their resurrection power gets released. That seems to be what John saw and is telling us about how to be. The purpose of Jesus' death is to bring about redemption. It convinces people of the love of God, and it, it's the power at work in people's hearts that helps take off the blinders so that people really believe that God loves me even though I've been an enemy against him. The church, which gets mentioned here as what? The body of Christ. We are his hands and feet. The best visible image that people have of Jesus Christ in this world right now is us. And when we look like Jesus, we help people know the love of Jesus. And this is why last Sunday we talk about love and justice and the significance that we, when we talk about loving people, don't just use words. So when the church suffers, resurrection power is released, people get saved. I, I'm leaning towards the argument based on biblical theology that while this is talking about Paul in the singular, I think, I think the best way to understand it is to realize that it's not that the, the lacking of the, suffer, of, the, of the afflictions of Christ isn't something as if the offering or the fact that Jesus died for every sin that ever committed was not sufficient. But it is the effective power of what happens as the body of Christ continues to suffer in the world in Jesus' name. It leads to people's salvation because they see. It leads to the church being built up. So Paul's acting like a bulwark and there's some affliction coming his way and it's protecting them so they have a little more time. This is all part of what God wants to do, God's love being revealed. Um, testimony from church history, powerful one. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Um, you know, as, as, as this gospel went out, the Roman Empire tried to stomp it. And they literally stomped Christians. But that that blood, which was on their hands, only ended up spreading it all the more. So, um, you can't be overly authoritative, but biblical theology, I would argue, at least supports the idea that while this may be singular to Paul, it could be exemplary for us. I've, I've, I've kind of tried to say this fairly precisely, but sometimes that doesn't always help. So, are there any questions on this? Did I... So the question was really, I'm not quite sure how to take the scripture because it's saying something that doesn't 
doesn't compute with my understanding of the sufficiency of Christ. Um, and um, again, it isn't an accusation as if the sacrifice of Christ was insufficient. It's more along the lines of, I think, identity that, um, that what was started on the cross, actually Jesus is continuing to do, where, but he's now suffering through his body, which is the church. And, and, and while it does not, this statement should not be seen as something that's attacking the legitimacy of his sacrifice for us. Instead, it's probably pointing to the efficacy of how that sacrifice impacts people as the gospel goes forward and gets heard. So the, the event itself gets incarnated in some way through the church that becomes effective for people who are alive today who witness that sort of love which is the spirit of Christ in his church convincing you that what Jesus did on the cross actually happened uh, it, so if you're going to talk about lacking it was probably lacking in that sense of, of how do you bring forward that event into the present helping to convince people who weren't witnesses something along those lines um, it's it's a startling statement, um, and 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 that's the part where we're, we're wrestling through it. We're sitting there. We're saying it's not attacking the sufficiency of Christ or His sacrifice for us, but it's more Paul is revealing something about how God planned for this salvation event to move forward in the world, and that very statement gets supported by what comes next. I've become a servant by the commission God gave me. Now, the, the word servant there is kind of a weak translation. It's the, the word is doulos, and it means slave. I become a slave. Now, slaves are servants, but just so you know, this is, I, I, you know, this owns me. I live for this. This is my identity. Paul identifies as a child of God, but he also identifies as a servant, a slave of God. I was bought at a price. Um, I belong to Jesus. I live for him. Now, let me draw a little bit of, and we get this directly from Philippians, which was written sometime in the same neighborhood, uh, according to our best guess, is Colossians. What kind of death did Jesus die? Uh, well, he died a Roman death, but... He, he died a specific type of a Roman death. Crucifixion. Crucifixion, which was only for slaves. If you were a Roman citizen, you could not be crucified. Jesus died a slave's death. Who in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage, but humbled himself, becoming a human being. Not only that, becoming a slave. A servant. Um, same word there. And, 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 it, and it is, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. Now the word there for serve is diaconus, which we get the word deacon. Um, but you know, that's a word servant. But typically, doulos, slaves, do the diaconus serving. So there you go. But the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Those are Jesus' words. Paul's reflecting on that. He's looking at the way that Jesus died. Jesus died a slave's death. He started up here and then he took the lowest position in the house, even washing his disciples' feet, which was what slaves did. And Paul sits there and says, I've become a slave to God. I've been bought at a price. I'm not my own. I live. Now, it's, it's not the have-to thing, it's the get-to thing. But, but it's so powerfully at work within him. So, I become a servant by the commission God gave me to present you the word of God in its fullness. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. Okay, this mystery, this word, mysterion, in Paul, 
it, um, in the New Testament, it has a technical meaning. It means that which was formerly hidden in God's saving purposes that was not yet revealed through the Old Testament and was in some way veiled has now been made clear. Now, it was prophesied about clearest place in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. By his wounds we are healed. Um, we esteemed him not. There was nothing in his outward appearance that drew us to him. Um, he was um, crushed for our iniquities. He was pierced for our transgressions. Um, the penalty that was ours was placed upon him. By his wounds we are healed. Um, but while he was cut off for a time, he would see the light of life again. Clearest prophecy that we have of, of describing the work of Jesus Christ. Just so you know, modern day Jews really ignore the passage. Because you read that passage and it's talking about this suffering servant and, and you read it in the context and this has new exodus, new, new creation, overtones, messianic hope, all this stuff. And what do you do? Because there's only one person in all of history who anywhere comes close to fulfilling that, and it's Jesus Christ. Did they pay much attention to the New Testament at all? Look, well, so the question was, do Jews pay much attention to the New Testament at all? Well, they don't, they don't view it as scripture, right? right? I mean, they, I mean they, they might, you know, because they interact and, you know, because... Judaism did, was not, let's see, I'm looking at time here. Uh, um, so Judaism had to reinvent itself after the destruction of the temple, right? So when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, we're not surprised by this because Jesus brought judgment against the physical temple and said God's spirit is no longer here. His presence is not here. Um, and he pointed to himself, destroy this temple, and in three days God will raise it from the dead. And, and when he went in before, and um, he drove the money lenders out the second time, John has told us early in his ministry, then we're told later he does it, that was a prophetic act of judgment against the, uh, against the temple. And, um, and Jesus, as even more than a prophet, was sitting there saying, if you want to find God, you will no longer look for him here. Now, that, that happened in 30 AD or 33 AD when Jesus died. In the year of his death, the destruction didn't happen for 40 years later, but the temple was destroyed and it's never been rebuilt. And you can't practice Judaism as prescribed by the Old Testament without the temple. Right? You can't offer the sacrifices. What, what, now, so what ended up happening is, is that after the temple, and they, and they had the precursors of this, both because of the diaspora and the creation, and, and really the center of life of the Pharisees in the synagogue. Remember that the temple was controlled by the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin was controlled by the Sadducees. And the Sadducees' power base was Jerusalem, and it was their connection to Rome. Well, the Sadducees and, and the Jews ended up, you know, basically their, their government got, you know, and their, and their influence got wiped out when the rebellion happened and finally Vespian came in and then destroyed the temple in 70 AD. So, so now Jerusalem's been destroyed. The temple has been laid flat. And the power and the influence moves to the Pharisees and the synagogues which are in every Jewish community where you have enough Jewish men to form synagogues. And they had what was called the Council of Jamnia, 70, 70, I think 72 AD. And um, according to tradition, the Council of Jamnia was the first time the Jews actually um, wrote down a list of what they thought were the authoritative books of the Old Testament, which happen, just so you know, to perfectly match the Protestant Old Testament. You know, there's that difference between Catholics and Protestants because they include intertestamental writings that we call the Apocrypha. 
The Jews never recognized those as being scripture. They saw them as being, you know, helpful, good, but, but not on the level of being scripture and coming from God. Council of Jamni established that first list by the Jews. They already had a Greek translation. They already had their scrolls. But, but, but why did they do it? Because when they reinvented Judaism, or it, it, and, you know, and I, maybe and I, I don't want to reinvent. I mean, it was, it was, it was by necessity. What do we do? How do we, how do we hold this together? We don't have a temple. There's no obvious way. And, you know, and they looked a little bit to the exile experience, but they centered her around God's word. And, um, and, and now Judaism got formed in the synagogue. But that Judaism um, that got reformed, um, which is kind of ends up spiritualizing some of the sacrifices, Judaism never was a proselytizing faith. It was us, the chosen people. And while if you read the Old Testament, you get the call that you're supposed to be a light to the nations, drawing all people to worship God, that was one of the things that the Jews often fell away from first. It was us versus them, and they were all the enemies, and we can't wait till God comes and wipes them all out, or at least puts us up over them so that we can squash them like they've been squashing us. So... In that history of Judaism, the, the, there, it, you know, it's stayed small. It's amazing that the Jewish people have, you know, have stuck through it, but they, they were given this very binding, bonding culture. And, um, and so they, they've lived out their faith. So long answer, lots of background information. You know, I mean, they could read the New Testament, and they probably do because they're they're all, except in Israel today, which is just a fairly modern occurrence. They've always been a minority culture and a majority culture, and mostly Christian. So many Jews are familiar with some level of the claims about Christianity, um, but um, and some Jews end up becoming Christians as they interact with the idea, but you know they, they don't. It, it, they have to be intentional. They don't get raised to read the New Testament. Um, they get raised in their Judaism. But, but again, what's interesting is is that you hear no Jewish scholarship and no real interaction with Isaiah fifty three. And um, now. Man, I went, I went down a long rabbit trail. I hope you guys are still with me. Um, okay, but I rejoice in what was suffered for you. I fill up. I'm sitting here and I'm making the argument that this is talking about Paul and his suffering. But I, but I would make the biblical, a biblical theological argument that it's exemplary. That in some way, we ourselves... God will use our sufferings to help draw people to himself. And if, it, and if that's what Paul was really pointing to with the idea of what was lacking, it's about how, how to make um, effective the work of Jesus' perfect sacrifice for us so that it continues to move forward. And that's something that is done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, I've become a servant by the commission God gave me to present you to the word as in its fullness, the mystery. Now, I was, I was drawing this argument of sitting there saying this biblical theological argument of exemplary and that we could recognize and see that God uses our, can use our suffering. And it's specifically our suffering when we're suffering in Jesus' name because we're holding up the gospel. Um. This is God's saving plan. This was the mystery, the technical word here, that which was formerly hidden about God's plan of salvation but now has been revealed, which is Christ and his death for us on the cross where the principalities and, the principalities and powers of this world are laid bare the greatest um, legal system of the ancient world and the greatest religion of the ancient world, which was Judaism, conspiring together against the Lord of glory so that 
injustice is done by that which was supposed to be just because the world itself has fallen and its understandings of justice are broken. And you can see it. That's not where salvation is. That's not where love is. That's not where the peace of Rome is. Remember, one of the great contentions here, Paul is in a Roman prison at this point. Rome claims that sitting on its throne is the Son of God, and they establish the great peace for the whole world, and that Caesar is the Savior of the world. It's a lie, and we've seen it. But we're suffering under it. But that suffering ends up being the means by which people are saved because it's through Christ's sufferings that sin gets atoned for. It's through Christ's sufferings that people see and the spirit gets released and resurrection power happens. Does, does this make sense? Okay, good. I'm just trying to expound it out that we're getting this. So the mystery that has been hidden and this mystery we're participating in. And that's, again, the support of this biblical theological idea that, yes, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, and Jesus works through our suffering and uses it in some way so that now our suffering doesn't have to be wasted. That was hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints, new creation people, the people who have the Holy Spirit. You and I, who see more clearly than all who went before, because now not only can we look at the Old Testament and the Revelation, but we can see clearly it was preparatory in what it was preparing for, and that was the coming of Jesus. And now we know that we're waiting for Jesus' second coming, and we know what our task is, which is to be the hands and feet of Jesus, that go out with the gospel of salvation and share that good news so that the light can shine. And how do we share the good news? In word and in deed and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Nice trinity, right? Okay, so... To them, which is us, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you. You become the sign to those who are still on the outside that there is a true Savior of the world, and it's not Caesar, and it's not the United States, and it's not any earthly power but it comes from above. To make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ the Messiah in you. So, uh, remember, we've been talking about this as we've been working through as far as honor, shame, culture, and what people were hoping for was glory. And the idea of glory is that in some way your name and reputation carry on beyond the grave. You know, and basically the Greco-Roman hope for the afterlife was kind of dark and shadowy. And, the, and that the best possible thing would be if you could really achieve some level of glory, maybe your name would be written in the stars. You know, you'd become like Hercules and there's a constellation or something like that. And, and in that, you know, there's this idea because they're pagans, and I, you know, I mean, we're not using that disparaging. That's reality. That's what they were. They were pagans. Is, you know, oh, if only we could live the life of the gods. Because the life of the gods, that's glory. And, 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 then, and then that goes on. I mean, what distinguishes the gods from mere mortals is they don't die and we do. Or at least they mostly don't die. But, you know, I mean... And, you know, it's a loose system and different ideas, but still, there you go. Now, that's your, that's your, that's your Greco-Roman context. And Paul here is talking into that context. He's using the language of glory. And listen to what he's saying. <coughs> to them, God, the one God, because all everything else is idols, has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches. He's going to bestow upon you the riches of true glory. Fame, radiance, reputation, the life of the gods, your name going on forever. Now that, that was some of the, the Greco-Roman hope 
And what the Colossians know and what you and I know is, is that that's exactly what Jesus promises. You're going to be adopted into the family of God. You're going to have an eternal destiny. Your name is going to go on forever because you are going to go on forever. And you're going to live a whole new quality of life. Which is Christ in you. The very life of God. The hope of true glory. Not a mere reflection, but glory in us and through us and shining out of us. The glory that's not our own, but the glory that's God. But we live in it and swim in it and partake in it. Paul, in some, in, in, his language is in some way talking of this. This they would have, they would have experienced something of this, and this is what they were aiming for. This is what it was all about. So, what do you want? I'll, I'll give you now another image that Paul uses. You want a little Stephanus wreath that you know is made of laurels, and you know it's your little crown that sits on your head because you won the little game, but then it you know it fades in a couple days, and then it's good for nothing. Or do you want the diadem crown that's made of silver and gold and precious jewels and it will never perish? What kind of glory do you want? There's different glories out there. And, um, and Jesus is offering the best kind. And it's not just for the Jews. But what the Gentiles are seeing is it's for us too. Because they're seeing you. And this is truly the savior of the whole world. So, talking about this suffering, talking about in some way being a bulwark, but uh, you know what? This suffering is worth it. It really is. Because look what's happening. Christ is living in you. Verse 28. We proclaim him. That's How can we not? This is our life. This is our glory. Woohoo! Admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all his energy, which is so powerfully at work in me. Um, and, and here we're again getting testimony. How do we live the Christian life? It's a life of participation. Let me encourage you. Every day, wake up. Holy Spirit, come fill me. Have your way with me. Be my leader. Empower me. I don't want to just be living my life for myself, but I want to be living my life with you. I'm giving you the reins. I'm putting you in charge. Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. That, that's how Paul lived. And, and, and so he, he strove to do what God called him to do. But he did not try to do it in his own strength or power. This isn't about me. This is about Christ in me. This isn't just what I do. This is what Jesus is doing. And just so you know, I, I mean, I, I mean, so we, we've, we've, I think we've got the, the bulk of the bite to go people <laughs> right, right here in Bible study this morning. You know, they come in and, and, isn't it much better to work together than just all by yourself? I mean, every once in a while, somebody gives me a headache and I want to work by myself for a time. But that's because of our fallenness. The best thing is it, there's more joy in working together. That's the kind of life that God wants for us. And that's the kind of life he wants with us. Not just me out there not paying any attention to him. But me talking to him through the day. Me telling him about my concerns, my problems. Me sharing my joys, my thanks, and me actually looking to him and saying, Jesus, I need your power because this is what I feel like you're calling me to, and I really want your name to be glorified. That, that's what Paul's giving us a picture of here. Um, how are we doing? Any questions? So, you know, you get me nervous when I just, it's like, okay. Okay, so um, we, we, will, we will keep going a little bit. Um, chapter 2, verse 1. 
I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. So why does he mention Laodicea? Well, good, good guess. Heather knows her Bible. Um, but we don't know if they're lukewarm yet, because <laughs> this predates. So in Revelation, th this is the other place where we hear, Jesus gives a prophetic word to John to the church of Laodicea, which was lukewarm. But if you, if you sat there and you went, well, why does Jesus call them lukewarm? And you, and you did your due diligence as a good student of the Bible, you'd sit there and go, what would lukewarm mean to them? And then you'd realize that they're in the Lycus Valley. And in the Lycus Valley, there is um, some fresh water and, um, that gets um, taken in through aqueducts. And there are some medicinal hot springs that are close by in Heropolis, which are really good for going and soaking sore shoulders from too much disc golf. Oh, they, made, they did have discs back then, you know, but um, they didn't have golf. Um, and then they had the water that was right around Laodicea that was tepid and it was good for nothing. And the lukewarm is, but now we've identified that we're in the Lycus Valley and about 10 miles across the Lycus Valley w that you could actually see, you could see Colossae. So, so there's a Christian community in Colossae and there's a Christian community in Laodicea. And both of them are communities that have been, churches have been planted probably by some companions of Paul. And it's altogether possible that... Um, Paul had this letter written to the Colossian church and then they copied it and they took it to the church of Laodicea because they would know about Paul and, um, and there would be edifying stuff in here. But just so, um, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. Okay, so you remember that it's hard to, you know, it's, it's easier to get the Jews out of Egypt than Egypt out of the Jews. It's, it's, it's easier to get us out of the kingdom of darkness and to bring us into the kingdom of light than it is to get all the kingdom of darkness out of us. You know, we, and so we, we still struggle in our flesh, our fallen human nature. So, if you had the choice, and you could sit under Paul, or you could sit under me, who would you want to sit under? Well, you better say Paul, because I choose Paul over me too. Um, but, you know, I mean, but, but in reality, we all want to sit underneath Jesus, and Jesus is in every one of us, and, you know, and we can't all be over where Paul is in Ephesus because we live in Colossae. So, so you're going to get a little bit of this thing where it's like, and we can see this in Corinthians, for example, which predates this. Well, I got baptized by Peter. I got baptized by Apollos. I got baptized by Paul. And Paul here is saying, listen, I may not have planted your church, but I want you to know that I care. And, you know, and, and, you know, and, and, Epaphras, and Epaphras is a great servant. Um, you know, he's one of my disciples. He's a disciple of Jesus, but I, I helped train him up. Um, and, but, but, but I care, and I want you to know, and I want you to be grounded. And so, now... You know, it is good that you guys take seriously the study of Scripture. I mean, the, it, just realize that, you know, this isn't the most important thing that you do. But it helps you get to the most important things. 
you coming to a Bible study, you being committed to growing, you trying to grow up in your faith. Because your mind is the center in which your transformation happens. Be renewed by the transforming of your minds. So, I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart. Heart, seat of the will, encouraged that you would choose to do the good. That when the fear faces you, you don't focus on the fear. You focus on Jesus. Jesus, what would you have me do? And you go and you do what Jesus calls you to do. And united in love. This isn't what you do by yourselves, but it's what you do together. And that you wouldn't fall away from your fellowship. But you would actually support one another. And you would do the hard work because we're a bunch of porcupines learning to dance. That you'll reconcile. That you'll forgive. That you'll work through your issues. United in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. Not just theoretical, but practical. I, yeah, I, I mean, I can look out and, and, you know, this is a nice thing. I, you know, we, we've been together for years. The gift of a church family. What it means to belong. What it means to know that there are people who care and pray and love and support and encourage. Um, that you're not in this alone. That, you know, that some of the best friendships happen as you work through some of those conflicts and issues and inadvertent porcupine pokes and, 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 and you get real with one another. And then it's like, wow, I'm actually taking off the mask. Um, and then the experience that you're serving in Jesus' name and you see the Holy Spirit and, you know, you can sit there and you can pray for your dog that their neck isn't broken and it looked like the neck was broken and then the next x-ray says the neck wasn't broken. And so it wasn't an answer to prayer because it was only a dog. I'm going to take it as an answer to prayer because Jesus cares. And, you know, and, and, you know, and so that's the joy right there. Understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. You, you, we talk about it. It's all about relationship. This, this is what salvation is about. Heaven is heaven because God is there. Jesus is there. It was never this abstract thing. It was never just about living in eternity. I mean, eternity could be a terrible thing if it's just monotony going on forever and ever. That's where some people, you know, they experience this life and they sit there and go, I don't know if I want to live forever. You, well, you don't understand. It's not this life forever and ever. It's a whole different quality of life forever and ever. But I can give you some ideas of what it tastes like. Imagine the best possible relationship that you've ever been in. Take out every bad thing and then just multiply it. And now you're getting something that's like it, that's a mere shadow of what you can expect. But it's not just one person, but it's many people. And then at the center, there is this one who is more glorious and beautiful and greater and smarter and kinder and richer and nicer and and, and, and funnier and anything that you could possibly imagine that has to do with joy. Ice cream. Ice cream. <laughs> Ice cream. Well, that's a good answer. Ice cream and chocolate chip cookies. Um, taste and see the Lord is good. See, we can always come up with scripture. That, uh, there we go. Okay, 957. Namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent with you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are. Oh, doesn't he sound like a Presbyterian there? <laughs> Decently and in order you are and firm your faith in Christ Jesus. Christ is. Um, now, 
You just got a little bit of a hint there of the possibility of some opponents that would trip you up. So just hold on to that. Um, let me close us in prayer. Oh, prayer request. Prayer request. Uh, Kimberly Bernie is having her wisdom teeth out tomorrow morning. Oh, we will pray for Kimberly wisdom teeth. Um, let's pray. Lord, we lift up Kimberly to you. Um, Lord, we pray that the procedure goes well and um, and that she recovers, no dry socket. And um, thank you, Lord, that um, that that dentists have pain medication today. And uh, and and while these, it's it's very helpful that these sorts of procedures can be done. Thank you for the way that they're done today. Uh, bless her and keep her. In Jesus' name, and we pray for all of us as we go out into this day, Lord, um, may we embrace this life with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful day. God bless.